Hey everyone, welcome to 2021 and Big Fork Chapel Online. So glad that you've joined us today. I hope that you've had a great holiday season and welcome to the very first Sunday in 2021. I am excited about today because we have a special guest speaker to be with us today, Pastor Lynn Lapka. He is actually one of our former pastors here at Big Four Chapel, and I am so looking forward to his message to be shared with you. Before we do that, would you make sure to jump into our comment section in our chat room? Would you let us know that you're watching, where you're watching from, and what was the best thing of your New Year's Eve party? It could be a lot of fun. Why don't you share that with us? And now let's take some time. So grab your coffee, grab your Bible. Let's take some time to worship together. Oh, we look to the sun, 
Set our eyes on the Savior. See the image of love. Sing His praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun. Set our eyes on the Savior. See the image of love. Sing His praises forever. morning um, and happy new year. Uh, it's wonderful to be uh, with you this morning. This online Big Fork Chapel. Um, it's always a pleasure uh, to take time to bring the word and to come back uh, to kind of my home at Big Fork Chapel. And uh, again, thankful for uh, pastor and the leaders here at Big Fork Chapel allow me uh, to take some time in the word today. And so I want to just do that. I want to get right into the word and uh, and thankful for technology to allow this to happen. And uh, my prayer has been that if you're joining us online, that uh, that uh, God's word would just penetrate your heart, your mind, and your soul. And um, really been praying um, a lot uh, about God. What are you saying to Big Fork Chapel and uh, and this particular passage? Um, and what we're going to talk about today is a very famous story. Uh, but I really do think in the times in which we live, it speaks a lot uh, to us today and some things to focus on um, and to get the heart of Christ in the middle of everything that's happening as we change uh, the year and and probably face new challenges, new surprises um, in the year to come. And um, so I pray that this word today that I really just feel like the Lord's place on my heart, it will minister to you and and I just want to share my heart with you from uh, what the Lord's been showing me in this word and and uh, over the years of just pondering this particular passage. And so today's message is simply entitled the reality of the Ro of the road. So the reality of the road today and I uh, will be speaking out of the book of Luke, chapter 24. And so if you turn with me there uh, to Luke, chapter uh, 24, um, we're just going to kind of get into it. And uh, just today, where do you feel that your road um, of 2021 is leading you? What road are you on today? What path are you on today? Uh, where do you feel it's leading you? Uh, what things in your heart are there that are present about maybe the situation you're in, maybe the Lord himself, um, maybe relationships, your workplace? Um, today, I want to talk about the reality of the road, the reality of the path you're walking and how sometimes Christ needs to intersect and come in and 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 give us a maybe a course change and maybe in 2021 what we really need to be looking to is a lot different than what we think and um, maybe the challenges of today uh, the real answer is maybe different. And so I'm going to kind of piggyback a little bit on the, my message that I shared uh, here at the chapel uh, a while back and kind of build upon that as these few disciples find themselves on another road, a road that they find themselves uh, just after uh, the death and burial uh, of Christ and how Jesus had to come and meet with them and kind of give them a course uh, change. And so my heart is, is that through this, the Lord will speak to you in a supernatural way to give you the reality of the road you're on and a possibility that that may need a course change. So let's look into the word today. I hope you're already there. Uh, Luke chapter 24 and verse 13. And I don't want to segment, segment this passage at all. I don't want to break it up. I'm just going to read it It's in, in its entirety, the story. And then we're just going to come back and review it. We're going to stay right here um, and, and really talk about this story, a well-known story, a very powerful passage in the New Testament. Um, but my prayer is, is that we'll hear it with a new heart, uh, um, a new mind um, in this new year of 2021. So let's go there. I'm going to be reading out of uh, 
uh, the King James and 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 uh, and again whatever pass whatever uh, the Bible you're accustomed to. But let's read this together. Uh, Luke chapter 24 and verse 13. It says, "And behold, two of them went that same day to a village that is called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score uh, furlongs." And they talked together of all the things that had been happening. And it came to pass that while they had communed together and reasoned among themselves, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were held back that they would not even know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communication is this, that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And in verse 18, one of them said, whose name was Cleopas, Answering him, said, Are you a stranger to Jerusalem? And have you not known the things that have come to pass here in these days? And he said to them, What are those things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests, the rulers, delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But, they, but we had trusted that he had been the one that would redeem Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done to him. Yea, and a certain amount of women had, of our company had also were astonished early at the sepulcher when they had found that his body was not there, saying that they had also seen visions of angels and said he was alive. And a certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. And in verse 25, he said, Jesus said to them, O fools and slow of heart to believe that which is all the prophets have spoken. Should not the Christ suffer these things, the Messiah suffer these things, and then enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. And when they had drew nigh to the village of Emmaus, where, where they were going, he, he was going as if though he would have continued further, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is close to evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in and tarried with them. And it came to pass, as he sat to eat dinner with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and, it, and then he vanished out of his sight, out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn? within us while he talked with us, by the way, and while he opened the scriptures to us. And they rose up that same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and, and they that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And they told them the things that were done in the way and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for this wonderful new year, this moment to open your scriptures. And I pray just as those men had those scriptures open to them, that our hearts also would be open and these scriptures would come alive to us today. Speak to us, O oh God. Help us to hear what you're saying to us in this moment, in this time. Oh God, breathe on us and open our minds and our hearts to your word. Thank you, God, for who you are and the word you have for us today. God, help me um, to speak it as you spoke it to me and, um, and help it, Lord, to penetrate our hearts and bring forth fruit of everlasting fruit uh, on into eternity for us and our household, for all those around us. And God, we give it all to you for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. This is an astonishing passage of scripture. Um, I'd love to say that it's my favorite, but then I end up saying that about all the scriptures. And and um, but I would say this that um, this one over the years has really spoken to me, um, and and ministered to me in ways that go beyond. And so today I'm just going to take small parts of this. There is so much in this passage that I'd love to discuss, but because of time, which I have no idea what time I started or how long. Uh, we have, but I'm going to try to touch on the, the, the highlights um, and maybe other times uh, break down more uh, of, of what 
Christ really did in these passages. But um, first of all, just the idea of what happened. Uh, Jesus has died. They saw it all. Uh, we don't know much about these that were the travelers on the road. We know one name. We understand very clearly that that these people were with Christ. They saw what had happened. Um, they had been a part of the conversation. And so we know that much. Um, uh, the other part is, is that uh, we recognize that something happened to their eyes at this moment, but they had been seeing everything that had happened. Um, they were on this road and it's the third day. Jesus, we know, has risen from the dead, but they had all that information, but did not see it. They didn't understand it. And they're on this road. And uh, Jesus comes to them at that point, And they're kind of reasoning together. But the important thing is, is that the, it says that the, their eyes were not open. Now, there could be much conversation about this, whether there was the circumstances, what they believed. But really, if I'm going to be honest with the studies that I've done in this passage, this is something supernatural that happened. We don't understand it. We don't always get it. Why would uh, their eyes be held back? Um, but, you know, there are times that maybe we don't get to see the whole picture and maybe God's got to do things differently for us. And maybe he holds back parts um, because he's got a, a way to teach us that goes beyond our understanding. And I think that's the same here. Now, if Jesus would have just came along the road and just showed up and they knew him, they would probably miss all the elements of the teaching that was so crucial uh, for what they needed at that moment. And I think sometimes if, if we were to take a moment to just ponder that, I, I think oftentimes we want Jesus just to show up. We want him to just fix our situation. We just want the answers. But see, he's the great teacher. He's the great leader and because of that, we need to trust the ways that he teaches us because they're going to benefit us the most. And so we would like to say, well, we just were blinded at the moment because of everything that was going on. But maybe there was more to it, that there was this supernatural element that God held back their eyes so that he could really show them a principle that I think would be important for them and would be very important for us. I mean, I would love that Jesus would just come into this room right now. I could move out of the way. He would just speak. Um, but what happens is in those elements, there's things that could be missed. And we need to trust the way he does things to teach us. And if I could say anything to you today, and not only what I've learned in my walk with him, that I don't always get the way he teaches me. I don't always understand it. And oftentimes, to tell you the honest truth, I would tell you today I haven't agreed with him and I've been angry. But I've also looked back and realized that the lessons learned in those moments were lessons learned that could never be taken from me. And if he would have gone about it maybe my way, I might have missed. Now, that's not what I'm preaching on today. Um, but that was definitely on my heart as I prayed. And maybe that's just someone... For someone out there that you're really saying, this is Lord, how I want to be taught. And maybe this is the way that I'm expecting you to show up. Maybe you've set up your life in such a way that it's, this is how I want you to teach me God. And um, maybe it's actually restricted the Lord um, and put him in a place that he's wanting to do it differently. And maybe you're missing out. And so I just want you to know that sometimes when we look at this, we it's uncomfortable to think that God is holding back their eyes, but I'm also comfortable with the one that I call Lord, and I want to trust him with that. And so that's just a little side note that uh, we have to understand that there was some deep truths that needed to be changed, and Jesus knew that. They were in a hopeless kind of situation, and because of that, I think he wanted to make sure that he showed them a way that he they could deal with this when it would arise again, because Jesus wasn't always going to just show up like that. And so I want to encourage you in that as well. Now, the Bible tells us that they were talking among themselves and they were reasoning together in verses 14 and 15. It says they talked together about all these things that had happened. And it came to pass while they were communing together 
and reasoning that Jesus himself showed up. So Jesus shows up in this moment and just asks them uh, about what are they talking about. And, and so they are discussing the things, they're reasoning among themselves, but they're kind of caught. There's some things that are coming out in their conversation. And, uh, and Jesus asks them about three things. He says, what are you talking about? Um, you're walking and your countenance is sad. Those are the three things I want to touch on just for a few moments. And uh, so, again, the talk, the walk, and your countenance, um, that you're sad. And that word really means you're brokenhearted. And Jesus comes, and he just breaks into the middle of that and says, what is it that you guys are dealing with? And I just think that that's really interesting and kind of cool all at the same time, because I, I'm not sure about you, but even in that moment, I think about how maybe in my circle of friends or family, that sometimes I can get caught um, just reasoning and and maybe be around people that aren't going to challenge me. And I stay in the same form of thinking, but it's Jesus that comes in in that moment and breaks that because realizing that maybe both of them are going down the same path and nothing's going to change. And so let's talk a little bit about those three, the talk, the walk, and the countenance. The first thing that he talks about is the talk. Um, I love that because oftentimes as we're reasoning and we're talking about things, the very talk, the things that are coming out of our mouth is the very essence that the Bible tells us it's, it's, it's coming out of our heart. And and I've always said that, and I, I, I can't take claim to this, this particular um, thought, but I've always said that talk to me that I might know you. So if I can get somebody to talk, I can usually get to know their heart, their history, their beliefs. And, and that's what Jesus was doing. What's your talk all about? See, our talk reveals our heart. And in, in, in verse 19 and 20, they said, uh, well, you know, uh, the, 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 it's Jesus is Nazareth. He was prophet, mighty indeed, and and word before God. And these are things that they're believing in. How the chief priests and rulers delivered him, and that those are those are truths that are that have happened. Um, but did you catch what it said? Let me say that again. He he asked them, well, "What what's your talk?" So let's start there. And he said, "What are you reasoning about? Are you a stranger? Do you not know what's happened in these days?" And he said, "Well, what things?" So he inquires and they respond back it's Jesus of Nazareth which was a prophet mighty indeed word before God and all the people now the chief priests and rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him that's what they're reasoning about but did you catch something that happened in their talk they have some real truths Jesus was killed by these people and even goes on to say that now it's even the third day and and the things that he said haven't come to pass and we're confused. But did you catch the one part? It says, Jesus is Nazareth, the prophet. What? What just happened? How did that change? Now, those that were with him recognized that he was the Messiah, the Mashiach in Hebrew, the deliverer. And now all of a sudden in their conversation, he's prophet? That's troubling. Ones that were with him, ones that had walked. All of a sudden, the Messiah and now prophet. How did that change? What's going on? Look at verse 21. I want to get to the bottom of that because I, I would say that their beliefs come out in their conversation. And somehow, some way, he went from being this rabbi, messiah, to now just a prophet. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not just saying just a prophet, but that's a big difference between prophet and messiah. Deliverer, even. Uh, goel in, in, in Hebrew. It's a big difference. Two different Hebrew words. And um, something's changed in their belief system. And I look at that and I say, what is it? But look at verse 21. It's, here's another one of their beliefs. But we had trusted that it would have been the one that would have redeemed us. There's that redeemer, the, the, the one that would pay the price, the one that would come in and have victory, the goel, the, the one that would come in and pay the price, be the victor. And then it goes on to say that would redeem Israel. 
And, and besides all this, it's the third day. See, they had put, they, the, the Bible says this, we had trusted that he had been the one that would have redeemed Israel, fought for them. Uh, their thought of Mashiach and Messiah, th- that they would come and, 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 and free them at that moment from what they were being oppressed by. And that's Rome itself, really. The, that's their biggest thing. And, and they trusted that he was going to do that. They trusted something else. They put their trust into something that was outside or maybe not as, um, as full as what was being offered. They didn't understand maybe what God was offering in that moment. And it went downhill. Remember, he has told them that he was going to do those things. He had told them that he was going to be the third day. And for some reason or another, they held on to that. But as things happened, it changed their view. We had trusted this. We had put our whole hope into this. And it changed when it didn't happen the way they had thought. It changed the even perspective on how they viewed Christ. And it just even that coming out of my mouth just challenges me. Um, I wonder um, on this road we're on, I, I wonder what your conversation would be. I, I want you to take a moment and just think about your conversation lately. You as one that believes Jesus is the Messiah, you that believe he's Lord, almighty God, I want you to take a few moments that the conversation is out of your heart and your conversation declares what's in your heart. I wonder today on your road, the one you're living, the one that the Lord's put you on today, I want to ask what your conversation has been. If Jesus was to show up, what is your conversation like? Have you trusted that he would do one thing and he didn't? Have you put your hope in the wrong thing? Have you put trust in the wrong thing? I think of the myriad of conversations that seem to be going on, whether it's social media or the like, and maybe it's about the president and the election and finances, the economy, the pandemic, um, uh, the, you know, the, Vaccination, um, I don't know. Well, maybe it's that relationship that by now you thought he would have healed, or maybe it's some dark thoughts or uh, something that's happened to you. And your trust has been more about what he would do rather than who he is. My wife said it the best, and I think I've heard it said before that, We serve a God that calls himself the great I am, but not the great I do. And that penetrates my heart. And and I sometimes wonder if we've put our trust into what he would do or what we think he's promised. And in a way that we think it should be done. And through that, it has changed the very perspective of how we see him. And that, in the end, is what's heartbreaking. Because now we're on the road thinking he's something different than who he really is. Jesus has to come in and break that point and challenge it. And and what we think and we believe about him has changed. And we don't want to admit it. I'm here thinking, I don't want to admit that. And sometimes we say, no, that's not how... But I wonder if our conversation wouldn't tell us differently. I wonder if the conversation we're having on the road tells differently. And we need to hear it again. Because I, it's so easy for us to, to see that and have this road and this reality of the road. But we don't believe that we've 
truly change the way we view God. And in that, so their talk has now shown that they believe something different. I, I put my trust into this, and maybe that's where we're at. Maybe you're putting a trust into president, into finances, into this vaccination, into the hope that, 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 that things will change around the world and, and be back to normal and all those things that we could easily put our trust in. But have we really put our trust into him? And now there's this things that are changing um, in them, and there's this sadness that he challenges them with. Your countenance, you're brokenhearted. And we don't want to admit that. You, you look around, and maybe you're just watching this at home in the comforts of your own home alone, and you wouldn't want to be that honest that you're really brokenhearted because what you had trusted hasn't happened, and and maybe you're viewing God and you're struggling. And I want to tell you today, you're not alone. You're not alone thinking that maybe he's not who he said he is. It's okay. I don't know who told you anything differently. But there's sadness and brokenheartedness and maybe some hopelessness. And, and that's what's happening to these men because they trusted in something. It changed their perception of God. They're confused, sad, brokenhearted. And this road, he says, and you're walking. And maybe you know this, maybe you don't. They're walking to Emmaus. Now, for you, that might not mean anything. I know exactly where this place is at. I've driven on this road. I've stood in the village of Emmaus. Um, it's not heading anywhere close to where all these events happened. It's away from the sepulcher. It's away from Jerusalem. Now, if we knew and believed that Jesus was going to raise from the dead, that's what he said, wouldn't you want to be kind of close to the proximity of where it happened? But they're not. They're not. They're walking the other way. Not only now has this belief, this hope, caused the brokenheartedness, changed their view of God, but now their, their walk has changed. They're walking in a different direction. They're not anywhere close to where they perceive, investigate, hope. I don't know, we don't want to say our road has changed. We don't want to say that we're walking in a different direction than we should be. Sometimes we're not just as honest as we could be in church, the sad thing is, as sad as that is. And um, this belief has changed their perception. It changed their countenance, and it changed the path that they were on. Don't eject yourself from this story. Don't think it's just them. Because the Bible tells me that these things were written down for our example, not just these, but the things of the Old Testament as well. And I don't want you to eject yourself out of the story. Don't do it. Don't do it. Is the road you're on drawing you near? Are you walking towards him? Are you investigating, searching? Or are you heading back out to a mass? Opposite direction. This story is not new. I mean, think about uh, uh, somebody that was told to do something and they go to Joppa to rent a boat to go in another direction. You know the story. Jonah. How about Peter that finds himself just going, hey guys, I'm going to go back fishing. I wonder if today's amends, the year that we've had, if it isn't time to look at the reality of the road you're walking on and say, I don't think I'm going in the same direction as I used to be, as I should be, as I want to be. And maybe I'm walking to Emmaus, but I'm not driving back. It's too painful. It's that's where Jesus died. That's where that event happened. That's where I lost hope. That's where I was hurt. That's where I was victimized. Uh, 
that's where I believed a lot in something and it didn't come to pass as I had hoped. And so I just want out of here. Don't eject out of the story. It's too easy. We do it all the time. We think that's back then. I have the Holy Spirit now. Uh, no, no, no. Don't do that. Because if you eject out of the story, you won't be challenged. It's hard to admit. It's hard to admit where our heart is today. Are you drawing near or are you going to Emmaus? It's a simple question with a fairly simple answer. But the story doesn't end there. There's a, a reality of this road that I want to talk about. And it's the stranger that shows up. And I want to take a few moments, and I, again, don't know how long I've been talking. Hopefully, it's not long, and uh, that you're staying here because there's an answer to all this, whether it's our talk, if it's our walk, or if it's the, if it's the, the, the sadness in our heart, there is an answer. And I want to talk about the reality of the stranger. I want to talk about the reality of Christ. I want to talk about him showing up on the road because that's our hope. Because the reality is true. Sometimes we believe in the wrong things. Sometimes we get caught into that. Sometimes it changes our perception of Jesus, of Almighty God. Sometimes it, it, it drives us to walk the wrong way. It, it sometimes drives our emotions. But there's hope. And that's what I want to talk about. Here's some realities of Jesus showing up in the story. I want you to know, number one, and if there's nothing else I talk about, if you want to shut the video off after this point, I invite you to do that. But listen to this. I want you to see in this story that it is Christ that finds them, that Jesus finds them in their brokenness, in their hopelessness, in the road that's leading them the wrong way. In their talk, their belief systems, even the perception of who he is, he finds them. The book of Deuteronomy says, if they are on the very outreaches, I will go after them. And I think about Jesus saying, you know, those guys, they're broken, they're hopeless, their conversations getting to the best of them. I got to stop. I got to stop them. I got to show up. And the hope of the story is I can answer that question and say, yes, I trusted in the wrong things. I have brokenness. I had trusted that this would happen and it didn't. And I find myself kind of going away rather than drawing near. But Jesus is the one that searches me out. That is a truth that starts from the beginning. I think about the book of Genesis. Adam and Eve has sinned and hiding away and who is it it's almighty god that searches them out it's jesus who steps off his throne puts on a, a flesh suit and chases after us and dies for us and redeems us and sends his holy spirit uh, it doesn't ever stop just two guys walking on a road he shows up I want you to know that he is there. He is right there. He is going on the road with you. He doesn't look at it and go, they're too far away from me. No, no, no. He chases after them. And in the middle of all the things he could be doing, he's just raised from the dead. He's like, hey, I could do a lot of things now. I'm glorified. Hey. But he stops to say there's two that are going on the wrong way. And I got to take care of that before I do anything else. Boy, that's a powerful piece of hope in the middle of the story. The second thing and I love about this is he wants to hear their heart. Tell me. He already knows it. <laughs> he knows what they're talking about. But I love the idea that Jesus takes a moment and says, tell me. I want you to know that he's got big enough shoulders to hear your heart. Tell me what you feel. Tell me what you believe. He's not there just to say, here, quick fix. I got other things to do. No, he just walks with them. For a long period of time, this isn't a short distance on foot. And he takes time and he says, tell me your heart. The Bible tells me this. Cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And I think we forget. We think, can I be that honest? And... What's troubling is most of your brothers, sisters, maybe your own family, maybe those in the church, we can't be as honest. It shocks them. 
<laughs> and and we've been shut down because of that. But the Bible tells me that I can cast my cares because he truly cares for me. And this story reminds us once again that we can just be open. You're not alone with your feelings. You're not alone with what you're going. You're not alone in going down the wrong path. You're not even alone with the choices you made yesterday. But he wants to hear what you're going through. And sometimes he's just a good coach because he wants to coach you through it. And, and part of healing is by being open and transparent with the Lord. Ah, as hard as that is, that's part of our healing because we need to hear ourselves say it. And it's in that moment that we open our hearts to God and he can do what is most needed in that moment. And that's, he doesn't just come and say, hey, you guys are wrong. Here's, I want to fix it. No, no, no. He says, tell me about it. And then finally, I, I don't like to say finally, because that gives you hope that I'm going to be done soon. Uh, I'm not going to be done soon or it'll be soon, but not real soon. So, but the next thing is, is he challenges them. He says, he shows up, he hears them, but what I love about this story is he doesn't just let them stay there. He challenges them and says, hey, guys, the Bible says fools. And this fool's word means you lack understanding. Uh, you lack what the truth is. You you only have part of it. And 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 this part is we need a little humility and, and, and it's okay to be corrected and challenged about what we may feel. Now, that challenge doesn't always come from Jesus himself. That can, might come from your neighbor. That might come from a fellow Christian or a family member that God's using in that moment. But may we never get beyond the place that we can be challenged and, and questioned and, and, and that we'd have the humility to say, you know, you're right. I am a fool. I lack understanding. I thought I knew, but I believed wrong. And that's what Jesus does. He shows up, he hears, and because of that, he has a moment to challenge them. And I think we all want that. We all have deception. We've all made wrong choices. They weren't completely wrong, but they lacked the fullness of understanding, and they needed to kind of have an awakening at that moment. Fools, what are you doing? So he comes, hears them, and challenges them, but I love this, he doesn't end there. It says, the Bible tells me then, he took them on a road of his own. It says that he opened the scriptures. It says, and beginning in verse 27, at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. The challenge opened them up to have a moment that Jesus then opened the scriptures to them and said, hey guys, look at what the scriptures really say about me. And he goes on to say, shouldn't the one that was coming to redeem you, didn't he need to suffer first and then enter into glory? The scriptures tell you that. Now, remember, when the Bible says scriptures, no matter where it is in the New Testament, it is always the Old Testament. Always. There was no New Testament. There was, even when Paul talks about scriptures, he is dealing with Old Testament. And so Jesus takes them into the Old Testament and says, hey, guys, look at this. In here, in the Old Testament, is me all over the place. And I want to show you how in it I'm going to come. And these things needed to happen to me that I would enter into glory. They needed that understanding. All they could see what was going on around them. All they could feel is what was happening, but they didn't. Have, they lacked the understanding of what the scripture said. And in that truth, it declared that that's, that's true. This needed to happen. And so Jesus took them into the scriptures. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? I always think, man, have Jesus open the scriptures up to us like that. And really what he was declaring is, is that he is the one. He is the promised one. This is what scriptures pointed to. Everything in the Old Testament pointed to me. I always tell people, if you read the Old Testament and you don't see Jesus, you're interpreting it wrong and your understanding is lacking because everything there declares who he is and what he was going to do and he was going to redeem mankind. I want you to know, he didn't correct them about uh, anything. He just showed them what the reality of his road was. 
through what was promised in Moses, the prophets, and the writings, all the Old Testament. And so he took them on a journey that he was the one, he was the promised one, that the scriptures declared that. And not only did it declare it, it gave a path to show I have to suffer, bury, three days later, rise from the dead. The scriptures show that. If we have time sometime and you want to go on a journey, there's a powerful passages in the Old Testament that talk about the three days and three nights. That he was relating to that. And he started in, in, in Genesis and shows uh, his own death there. And um, I have so many things going through my mind. I'd love to just start in Genesis 1-1 and begin to show you how Jesus is revealed there. But we don't have time today um, to do that. But he took them to the Old Testament to show that he was the one, the promised one, the great I am. And he showed them in Scripture that he is the one. Even though circumstances, the things they trusted in weren't right, were lying to him. He took them to that place and said, here is the Scripture that show you. And I think in the times we live, we need more understanding of the scriptures now more than ever before. Jesus's answer to them wasn't a rebuke. It was a challenge. It wasn't you're wrong. It was I'll show you truth through the scriptures, what has been written. And that will free you. And I wonder today if we've missed that the answer to our today is still the word of God. Jesus himself challenges in the book of John, chapter 5. Look at this. I can't tell you how for many years I, I missed this particular passage um, and, and what Jesus really said here. Listen to what he says in John, chapter 5, in verse 39. 539 says this, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are which testify of me. And I think today we still are kind of searching scriptures thinking that in it there's an eternal life and even in our devotions it's like we look for one scripture that we can hold on to and don't get me wrong i'm i'm not lessening the fact that there's scriptures that really speak to us but the purpose of the scriptures wasn't that in it you'd find life but in it it would show where life comes from and that is jesus himself see even then they search the scriptures what can i do 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 how do i get this life uh, how do I get a perfect life? How can I have the answer and the key to my today? And Jesus himself says, the word of God, the scriptures were created to show me the revelation of me. And I wonder today that maybe you're starting the year in the Bible or uh, through the Bible in a year or uh, in your devotional life. If it isn't just about what the word can do to you, but rather the purpose of the word was to reveal who he is. And I'm telling you today that if we go for the wrong purpose into the word of God, we may miss the true purposes of God in the word. So make sure when you approach the word of God, you're doing it for all the right reasons. And that is that we might know him because that's what the scriptures are for and what they're about. It's not always about us. It's not always about what we need for the day, but it's seeing who he really is. Maybe we're just looking for scriptures for an answer or direction and, and our motives are then maybe all messed up and we become more about this me gospel and, and, and we wonder why we start putting our hopes in the wrong things when really we should be drawing near to the scriptures to understand the scriptures to grow in awe of him. Rabbis of old, the teachers of old, for centuries, even during Jesus' time, said that the study of God's word wasn't to gain knowledge, but it was to gain an awe of God. Maybe it's time for that again. Because I want to tell you that's what Jesus did. The power and the wholeness of the word changed something. Look at what happens. Jesus comes, he finds them, he hears their heart, he corrects them, and then shows them the answer, open scripture. <laughs> I love 
what one commentator said. He said, he opened the scriptures, opened their understanding, and opened their eyes. And boy, don't we need that today. We need those moments today. The result is verse 33. It says, and they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the 11 gathered together and they that were with them. They returned the very hour, whatever they had purposes of before, it switched, they ran back. Oh, they ran back. Whatever it was in that moment, they ran back. And um, wow, that moment, that reality, that second, changed them. They ran back in the very hour, in that very moment, and listened to their words now. What their conversation and reasoning were before, listen to verse 35. And they told the things were in the way, and how he was known of them in the breaking of the bread. Verse 34 says, the Lord is risen. And they came into that situation, and they ran back. And they got their direction right, their conversation changed, and their hope was returned into the right situation. And it comes because of the reality and the power of the understanding of the Word of God. And Jesus is open in their eyes, open in their heart, and open in their understanding. And it changed them. And today, the reality of our road is apparent before us. What is it today? What is it today? How is your conversation? How is your heart? How is your countenance? Where is your road leading you? And then to say, God, I I need those things changed. God, open the scriptures to me again. Give me hope again. If I'm missing something, help me. If I'm putting my trust in the wrong thing, show me. And I want to encourage you this year as we start this new year, this first Sunday of 2021. You you hear it from pastors all the time. I guess, as many of you may know, I I don't pastor a church anymore. more of an evangelist, teacher now. And um, I would just say this to you. And you hear us say it all the time. But it's what I see in the Word, and I can't get it off my mind. And that is just simply this. The power of God's word is still as powerful as it was back then as it is today. And I want to encourage you to get there, to study, not just for the word for the day, not just for something to put your hope in, but rather to see who he is and grow in awe of him once again. Then it might change your road, your direction, your communication, and bring hope back into a heart that might be broken. Ask him for that. Have him open your eyes once again to who he really is. I know we want all this to change. Um, I know we've been broken with what's around us. I don't want to lighten that. That's not what I'm here to do today. It's been tough. But I still think we're facing a lot of tough times ahead of us. I don't want to give you any fluff. I don't want to give you a word for the year. I'm not here to do that. We're going to hit some tough times. This this thing is not over. I don't think it's going to be over anytime soon. Is that hopeless? No, because I put my hope into one, one only. And I encourage you to do the same. That we're not going to put our hope in into a change. We're not going to put our hope into a presidency. We're not going to put our hope into a vaccine. We're not going to put our hope into our jobs, our finances. No, no, no. We'll end up going in the wrong direction. We'll end up brokenhearted like these guys. No, no, no. Our hope has got to be in him, that he's the risen one. And I might not get it today, but I'm not going to walk in the wrong direction. I'm going back to Jerusalem. I'm going back to that place to investigate, to search until I find the truth. And in it, I'll have freedom.
You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies to long.
Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for this word. Thank you for your scriptures. Open our heart, open our eyes, and open our understanding. Breathe on us once again today, God. I pray for the Big Fork Chapel today. Pray for the leadership. God, I pray for your body there, that you would bring a newness, hope, strength, and the courage to turn around and run back to you and a transparency and a humility before you to truly hear you in correction, in taking us on a road of discovery with you. God, will you, for those that hear my voice today, will you just move on their hearts with a new excitement, a burning in their heart, just like these men had, that would just be a revelation of who you are, a yearning, a hunger for your word, a hunger for your presence like never before. And God, may if things don't change around us, God, our heart would be growing stronger in you and our path would be leading us to you and the things around us will just fall to the wayside in the reality of who you are and the promises you've made. Thank you for your people today. Thank you for what you're doing at the Big Fork Chapel and on online with those that have listened today and the lives of those listening today. Bless them mightily by your word. And we thank you for it. And we give you all the glory and praise today. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. God bless you. Thank you to the Big Four Chapel and, and for you for allowing us, for us just to have this moment and for me to speak the word, uh, it's such a pleasure and a privilege. May God abundantly bless you in 2021. We'll talk to you real soon. Blessings upon you and your household. Mm -hmm.